make demands and fight for a right for the voice and to have the right to vote. The women's movement was full of fighters who refused to be treated as second-class citizens. But still today, 100 years after women received the right to vote, to vote the battle continues. 2019, we celebrate a historic number of women in Congress, but still we're only 25% of the decision makers who sit under this dome adorned by Lady Freedom, when a woman, when women today represent 50% of this country. Throughout history, women have been resilient, but we will not stop fighting. We have no plans to stop now. We will fight against the forces that continue to hold women back. This White House administration has tried to close its doors on women, but we will not be locked out. To an administration that has closed its eyes to women, we will be seen. To an administration that refused to listen to us, we will be heard. We will continue to fight for equal pay for equal work, access to quality health care. We will fight against sexual harassment and sexual violence and we will continue to fight to raise women and their families out of poverty. We stand together to make a message that's very clear. We're ready to fight. We stand at a time when women need more protections, opportunities, and we have an administration that is reckless in rolling back the progress we made. And I want to be on the record, joined by the Democratic women's of this Congress, that we are here to let every woman in America know we've got your back and that we are not backing down and we will continue to fight for every woman in America. I will now like to introduce a person who has led the Women's Caucus, the Democratic Women's Caucus, a fighter and a role model and an example for women who understand that we do not need to bow, ask permission to lead. I want to introduce the brilliant Lois Frankel from oh, Florida. So that was pretty cool. Okay. Hello, everybody. <laughs> just as a little housekeeping, just to let you know that uh, all our Women's Caucus will be taking a mass photo in, on the CVS stairs uh, right after this. I mean, anyway, Brenda, thank you for organizing us today and uh, my colleagues for being here. So the Democrats obviously won the majority in the House because women across the country stood up for our rights, marching, organizing, and voting, and they were anxious, not just about the president. Uh, young women whose childcare costs are more than their rent, grandmothers who are having to cut their pills in half because they can't afford prescription drugs, mothers and daughters who can't take leave to take care of loved ones because of afraid of losing their job, and all women who are now worried about access to full reproductive care. Now, women make up 40% of breadwinners today, breadwinner households. A family are depending on women earnings. Yet, the research shows that women are still earning 80 cents on the dollar, and it's w even worse for women and color. It's sort of shocking. Let me give you some examples. Male civ civil engineers make an average of almost $78,000 a year, while women earn roughly $64,000. Women nurses make $58,000 annually, while men rake in $64,000 for the same job. Lower income workers, uh, like retail workers, for example, men earn roughly $38,000, and the women counterparts just $27,000. And what does this do? This leaves women in rough shape for their retirement. Over a 47-year career, as estimated by the Association of University Women, um, women can lose up to $700,000 to $2 million in earnings. Uh, so this is we are we are literally cheating women out of retiring in dignity. So tonight, when President Trump looks gives his State of the Union, when he looks at the Democratic side of the House, he will see a wave of suffragette white as Democrats promote a crucial piece of our for the people agenda, tackling issues 
that keep women from reaching their full economic potential, like raising the minimum wage, paycheck fairness, access to affordable quality uh, childcare, promoting family-friendly workplaces, and of course, access to health care. Uh, with the new majority, our Democratic Working Women's Group, we're going to bring all this to the forefront because women and their families have waited and waited too long for the economic security that they deserve. And now I want to bring on the godmother, <laughs> the godmother of pay equity and really she's been a leader in all these women's issues, Rosa DeLora of Connecticut. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Lois. Thank you. And I thank all of our colleagues who are here today and all of you have come out to be with us. Uh, the state of women is resilient in the face of the Trump administration, whose coordinated hollowing out of government is hurting women. So much of the damage does not get the kinds of coverage that it should. The chaos of the White House dominates the news. But the Trump administration's rollbacks are clear. Even in just the agencies that I oversee as chair uh, of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Labor, Health, Education, and Human Services. Examples. Department of Health and Human Services decreased nursing home protections for seniors, 70% of whom are women. It attacked contraceptive care, costing women $1.4 billion per year in co-payments. It went after Planned Parenthood, Title X, and comprehensive sex education. It is in the process of dismantling the Affordable Care Act, which for the first time placed women's health on par with men's health in this country. And you've heard the phrase before, uh, it was uh, being a woman for the first time was not a pre-existing condition. The Department of Education rolled back protections for sexual assault survivors and allowed predatory for-profit colleges to get away with financially exploiting women seeking a college education. Women comprise 56% of those enrolled in colleges and universities, 65% of those at four profit colleges, and they hold two-thirds of outstanding student debt. It's roughly about $800 billion. Department of Agriculture limited millions of women's access to anti-hunger programs, including the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, the Food Stamp Program. Research has shown that across their lives, women are twice as likely as men to have received SNAP benefits, which has kept approximately 42.2 million people all over this great nation from going hungry. And the Department of Labor unraveled the overtime rule, which the Institute for Women's Policy Research said would have provided overtime pay for protections for 3.2 million women. The Department of Education also effectively reversed steps by the Obama administration, uh, this is the Department of Labor, to fix the gender pay gap, specifically the previously approved EEO-1 uh, form, which would have helped 30.6 million women negotiate for equal pay. They did so even when women in 2019 continued to make only 80 cents on the dollar, on average compared to men. But the state of women is resilient. We are not shying away. We are fighting back. The House just welcomed its most diverse class in history, including the most female members ever. We have five full committee chairs. We have 28 uh, full or subcommittee chairs in the House, and I'm proud to say on the Appropriations Committee, we have the most uh, subcommittee chairs um, and full committee chairs. Um, and we know that women, when women are at the table, the agenda cha changes. So we are seizing the moment to advance a positive agenda for women, families, and working people, to unrig those rules, to level the playing field. We're gonna pass paycheck fairness. That way everyone can more fully contribute to the richness of America and to pocket what they have earned. Time has come for women to make the same pay as men yeah. for the same work. My mother, Louisa DeLauro, was New Haven, Connecticut's longest serving member of the city council, not the longest serving woman, 
the longest serving member, over 35 years of service. When she was only 21 years old, she wrote a call to action for women everywhere. She closed it by saying, and I quote, come on girls, let's make ourselves heard. <laughs> women made themselves heard in the 2018 midterms. We are making ourselves heard now because in spite of this administration's deregulatory tax, the state of women is, was, and will be strong. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you someone who is a, a real fighter for um, women and their families, who now chairs the Congressional Black Caucus, and that's our colleague uh, Karen Bass from California. Thank you. Karen. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank Congresswoman Lawrence and um, Congresswoman Frankel for their leadership in the Democratic Women's Working Group for putting this together. So I'm here to talk about the state of black women in this country. So the state of our pay is unequal. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, black women in the United States are typically paid 61 cents for every dollar paid to a white man. But instead of creating job programs or investing in raising wages, what does the Trump administration do about it? He signs a tax scam guaranteed to benefit only the richest Americans with a recycled promise of trickle-down that we've been waiting on since the 1980s. The state of our health is not well. Black women are three to four times more likely to experience a pregnancy-related death the, the uh, percentage of black women that die in childbirth is higher than most developed countries, if not any developed country on the planet. We're more likely to have heart disease or diabetes as well. But instead of investing in our health, what does the Trump administration do about it? Not only did he push a bill to take away health coverage from millions of Americans, he continues to try to sabotage the Affordable Care Act via death by a million cuts. The state of our freedom is under attack. The incarceration rate for black women has increased 800% over the last 20 years at every level how women get involved in the criminal justice system, what happens to them while they're incarcerated, and what happens when they get out, our criminal justice system lags behind in modernizing and humanizing the way it treats all women, but especially black women, given the disproportionate numbers. The state of our pay, the state of our health, and the state of our freedom, unfortunately, there's not much good news, but the state of our voice. The state of our voice is powerful. The administration saw it in November 2017 when Alabama took Doug Jones to Washington, D.C. The senator from Alabama was elected because of the support of black women. The administration saw it in November of 2018 when we took back the House and watched history made as the first and second time a woman in the House of Representatives was Speaker Nancy Pelosi. And you know what? Uh, he hasn't figured out how to deal with that situation at all. <laughs> but the power of our voice is clear. We will hear the power tonight. The woman, I believe, was elected as the governor of Georgia when she delivers her inspirational message, Stacey Abrams. We know that the administration will not be able to resist an attack afterwards. He attacks because basically he's afraid of the power of our voice. But whatever, whenever we are faced with attacks, we know that still we will rise. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce one of our very powerful and dynamic new members of the House of Representatives from the great state of Massachusetts, Ayanna Presley. <laughs> Take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair. So wonderful to be here in solidarity with my fellow sister uh, Congresswomen, uh, both in solidarity, solidarity and I could argue in collective resistance. Um, our very existence, it seems, is the resistance uh, in light of the times we find ourselves in. Uh, tonight, we expect the occupant of the White House to utter the customary phrase, the state of our union is strong. If that is true, it has little to do with the Trump administration. If our union is strong, it is because of its resilient people who have succeeded in spite of, not because of, the actions of this administration. If our union is strong, it is because of the people who have endured, who have sacrificed, who have mobilized and organized to fight for our fundamental human rights. 
If the state of our union is strong, it is because of dreamers like my guest for tonight's State of the Union, Stephanie from East Boston, who refuses to allow her future or her family to become bargaining chips. She is a dreamer, her father is an asylum seeker, and her mother is a TPS holder. As Stephanie bravely stands up against this hate wall and the emboldening of rogue agencies with racist policies. She is standing up on behalf of her family and her entire community. If our union is strong, it is because of mothers like Sabrina Fulton, who know the unimaginable pain of a gun stealing their child's life. A child like 17-year-old Trayvon, who would have celebrated his 24th birthday today. Women like Sabrina Fulton and Lucy McBath, who are fighting every day to ensure that not one more parent knows the harrowing loss of gun violence and racial profiling. If the state of our union is strong, it is because of survivors of sexual assault assault, who, when we were faced with forces that tried to silence us, we marched, we rallied, and we built our own megaphones. If the state of our union is strong, it is because of the dis disability advocates who put their bodies on the line fighting for health care justice. Today, we fortify ourselves with a vision of what is possible, policy anchored in community and crafted by those most impacted. Each of the women standing here today represents hundreds and thousands more. We walk through this life not just as individuals, but carrying all those we have loved, we have lost, and who have shaped us. Together we assert that no one should go bankrupt while fighting for their lives. We can have Medicare for all. We can act with urgency to save our planet, to enact a Green New Deal. Every person deserves a good job and a livable future. We can tackle the growing maternal mortality and female incarceration rates for black women. Together, we will address the staggering student debt that is crippling dreams and choking at the full promise of our nation. Together, we can actualize our commitment to fair pay for fair work and provide back pay to our contract workers crippled by the shutdown and the pay that they deserve. Together, we can end the public health crisis of gun violence that is claiming lives on city blocks, at schools, and in our faith houses. We have the conviction. We have the political courage. We have the women we need to lead us through this pivotal moment in our nation's history. We have each other, and we are the majority. All right. I agree with that. <laughs> now uh, introduce Ron. Oh, oh, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> So first, again, I just um, I was remiss to just uh, to thank uh, Congresswoman Lawrence and Frankel, respectively, for their leadership and their counsel and their mentorship and for convening all of us together today. And now I would like to invite uh, my freshman colleague and sister, uh, Congresswoman Veronica Escobar. Well, good afternoon. It's great to be here. And I have to say it is such a privilege to be here with these strong, incredible women, especially the returning members who have long been fighting for what is right and what is good, especially for women in our country. I'm so proud to be with the new members who have helped create and build this majority and this record number of women in Congress. And tonight we will be seated in solidarity because we know that this country is better. We know that Americans deserve better. We know especially Especially that women deserve better. Congresswoman Bass laid out the very stark reality that exists for uh, black women in our country, and the same is very much true for Latinas in our country. We too share some pretty heavy uh, burdens and face significant obstacles when it comes to access to health care, access to education, and access to uh, good salaries and great jobs. I would tell you also that for immigrant women, the challenge is especially great. And it's never been greater than it has been over the last two years. And, and I'm proud to stand here today with, with my guest, uh, a dreamer from El Paso, a, an incredible talent, a woman who doesn't see obstacles but sees the future. Senaida Navad represents 
what women in my community have to go through when they are treated as second class people and individuals. But Zenaida actually in many respects has it better than some immigrant women, especially those women on the U.S.-Mexico border, the safe and secure U.S.-Mexico border, where we have seen this administration rip children from the arms of their mothers and put them in cages, all in the name of so-called border security. Tonight, we will undoubtedly hear about the wall that this administration has been so obsessed with. Those of us who live on the safe, secure U.S.-Mexico border, especially women like Senaida, especially like so many women. My community is made up of one quarter immigrants and we are one of the safest communities in the country. We know that walls don't work. We know that walls are unnecessary and we know that they are symbols of xenophobia and bigotry and hatred. And I am so proud of this caucus and I am so proud of this party that has said enough. Enough of false solutions that harm families. Enough of, of false solutions that harm communities. I am so proud to be part of a majority that wants to solve real challenges, to deal with climate change, to deal with income inequities, with deal, to deal with access to health care for all, to finally deliver on the age-old promise of comprehensive immigration reform. Those are real solutions that help our families, that help our communities, and at the same time, fighting for equality for women, the heads of households, the center of families, the backbones of communities. So I am proud to be in the majority with these women standing here with me, proud to represent Senaida, who represents the best future America has to offer. And I'm looking forward to fighting for what is right and what is good with these women. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take questions. I take questions. We have uh, one other member who is joining us today, Madeline Dean. Uh, had the great opportunity to represent her state as an ambassador for women and she will have a few remarks and then we'll wrap up and take questions. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank these able chairs uh, for wel welcoming me uh, to this uh, majority, to this caucus. My name is Madeline Dean. I represent Pennsylvania's fourth. Uh, and I am a member of the Pennsylvania Commission for Women. I was on that commission uh, appointed by Governor Wolf. And, and just this week, he asked me to remain on that commission uh, as I serve now in Congress. Uh, I have to tell you, it's very exciting to be here uh, for what is the first State of the Union that I will see uh, from the, the House of Representatives. Uh, it's a thrill to be here. Uh, but I'm very concerned. Certainly we know that this is an opportunity, it's actually the obligation, the constitutional obligation of this administration and this president to report honestly, openly, and fairly uh, the truths about the state of our union. I agree with the women who stand with me. The state of our union is strong, but I sadly believe it will not be because of the, the message that we hear from this administration. Unfortunately, I am worried uh, that this administration will just zero in on a tantrum in a sandbox over a partial wall that Mexico was going to pay for. So I ask you, the, the members of the media, to stay with us and demand that this administration speak globally to our aspirations as a country, speak globally about protecting our envir environment, speak globally about protecting our children and our family members from gun violence. I do believe the state of our union is strong, not because of the spat that this administration wants to take up day after day after day, but I believe it's strong for the person, for example, that I've invited today. Jamie Amo, a Columbine survivor, is joining me. She became an activist. She's a young mother herself. She became an activist, uh, much more engaged following Parkland. She could relate to those brilliant Parkland students who will be here. Uh, and so I say the state of our union is strong because of people like Jamie who believe that we must and we will do something to end gun violence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madeline. Excellent. Good job, everybody. I just want to take uh, a moment for the media to reflect, and you'll be hearing more from me about this. Have you ever thought about every time our country tries to create an image that reflects our democracy, it's in the form of a woman? So think about justice in this country. It's a woman who's blindfolded and holding the scales. Think about the woman who sits on the top of this dome 
lady, a statue of freedom. It's a woman with a sword and a wreath in her hand. Think about when we talk about our country and the diversity and inclusion and being welcoming, it's a woman, the Statue of Liberty. So it's by no consequence that we are gathered here today to say in this 100th year, a country that every time they try to pull the soul and the dignity and the passion of this country together, it's on the arms and shoulders of a woman. And so I want you all to know that as this caucus grows, we're at the largest we've ever been. We will continue to be the voice, the compassion, and the driving force of this democracy. Thank you so much, and we'll open it up for questions. Good job. Yes. Okay. This is your first State of the Union address, and so much in advance has been said about the difference between this State of the Union and the last week when we aired on last week, the words of Nancy Pelosi behind President Trump on the dais. What message do you want to send for this historic first large group of minorities, women in the freshman class, and two, President Trump is supposed to talk about bipartisanship tonight. Are there areas you think you could work with President Trump? Sure. I mean, I Introduce think the, yourself. Um, Mary Gay Scanlon, Pennsylvania 5th, one of the four new female members from the Pennsylvania delegation. Um, so I think what's different this year, of course, is the solidarity. We now have 96 mm -hmm. women in, um, the in the Democratic delegation. Mm -hmm. We're wearing white in honor of the suffragists. Um, June 4th of this year will be the 100th anniversary of mm -hmm. the passage of the 19th Amendment through Congress. Um, I'm wearing a pin that was worn by Alice Paul, mm -hmm. who was one of the suffragists who graduated from Swarthmore College in my district, but it was given to her after she chained herself to the White House fence demanding the right to vote. So this is an ongoing struggle, mm -hmm. um, and we're here, we're, we're not here to play. We're here to be serious, I think as several of the mm -hmm. um, speakers said, we're serious about making a better world for the people we represent, for the children who follow us. Um, we are hearing that the president has a message of unity and bipartisanship. Mm -hmm. um, we just ask him to have his actions ma match his words. I mean, mm -hmm. if he says unity but then demands a wall that literally disrupts unity mm -hmm. or continues with divisive rhetoric, then um, you know, bipartisanship and unity has to go both ways. Excellent. Yes, ma'am, in the back. I think we all have family members who we love and family members that we uh, encourage. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. Because, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm on appropriations now. And I have been telling people while getting this amazing opportunity, you can say what you want to, you can stand in front of a mic, you can even pass a bill, but follow the money. What do we fund? Where does our money go? What are the results? And so I am, um, I wish the family well. Right. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It's 13 in the House. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm curious if you have conversations with Republicans. I mean, whether they're in Congress or not. And if you can speak to sort of talk about that. Yeah. A, a need on the other side that we know they're struggling. Yeah. What's happening with a lack mm -hmm. of women representation? Able to also talk about that. Mm -hmm. Well, first, I want you to know that you to all women were invited to wear white tonight. We did it on a bipartisan basis. There is a bipartisan women's caucus. It's difficult on some issues. Uh, last cycle, we did a lot of work on sexual harassment. Brenda's going to be our representative leading mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the uh, bipartisan mm -hmm. along with Madeline, with Madeline mm -hmm. Dean. And we, we try. We, we actually do try. I, just to say, I, I think I'm one of the folks who's here the longest. Um, and I think back to the uh, cooperative effort of uh, bipartisanship amongst the women like Connie Morella and 
uh, Pat Schroeder and Marge Rockema and uh, Barbara Kennelly and Nancy Johnson and myself and others and Nita Lowy and Nancy Pelosi, um, where we, Louise Slaughter, where we came together, uh, particularly around the issue of women's health, uh, where it made a tremendous difference uh, in being able to um, uh, forward a, a, a public policy uh, that focused on women's health. And in particular, I would mention that uh, when I talk about agendas changing, that is the advantage of, 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 of women uh, in great numbers or in majorities. Uh, we were able at that time to make sure that the National Institutes of Health, uh, while there were no uh, uh, women in their clinical trials, women or minorities, they did their uh, their, all of their testing on men and then extrapolated that to, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to, to women. Well, we were able on a bipartisan basis to break that down uh, so that today women are included and minorities are included uh, in the clinical trials at the NIH. We have an Office of Women's Health at the Department um, of Health and Human Services at the Department of Labor. So we have in the past. I think uh, there has been a hiatus from some of that in the future, but today I sit on the Appropriations Committee and I look to Chairman um, uh, Nita Lowy, but also to Ranking Member Kay Granger uh, and the women who serve and where we work collaboratively on issues that not only affect our state, but affect uh, families uh, in this country. It is doable, uh, and it probably uh, exists at the rank and file uh, level in a, a more robust way than uh, people do understand. Yeah, just let me add that last cycle, we were able to work together with Republican women on sexual violence in the military, mm -hmm. on the sexual assault scandal with the gymnasts. So we've tr those are the kinds of issues we make progress. And we've made a commitment. My co-chair is um, Deb Debbie Lasko and Jennifer Gomez. And we have committed to working on domestic violence for women. We're committed to working on ending that, that horrible statistic that the United States is known for being the leading country in the world where we are going backwards in the number of women dying in childbirth. That is unacceptable. And so maternal mortality, domestic violence, and poverty with women. One more question. Can I just add to that? Yes. Um, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, I do think, and this is in no way giving short shrift to the contributions of our male colleagues, but I do think that women do lead differently, that we are conveners, we are coalition builders, and as was stated before, when we are at the table, the conversation shifts, and that's true regardless of which side of the aisle that you that you are on. Uh, we have already shown our ability and our desire to work together um, both on um, H.R. 8, uh, the gun bill. Uh, there's been bipartisan uh, work done together uh, to end the scourge uh, of human trafficking. Um, and there are shared uh, burdens in everything from uh, limited health care access to addressing um, uh, the cost of child care, uh, the challenges for caregivers, and so many other issues. And so um, Congresswoman Lawrence, uh, our chair, very uh, eloquently spoke to uh, what women embody uh, naturally, which is why we be have become the symbol of freedom and justice. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would not be true if we were not eternal optimists. Uh, and so we'll continue to be uh, optimistic and continue to be um, uh, conveners and facilitators and agitators, too, when we need to be. So. We are going to have to wrap some on. The three hands are up. If you just ask your question, then we'll respond yeah. collectively. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, David Smith of The Guardian. For, for those reasons just described and the other issues you've talked about, you mm -hmm. think it's important that the, the Democratic nominee in 2020 is a woman? Our next the next question. question. And sir. Uh, we've heard pretty strongly from one of your personal uh, colleagues what she would like to do for this president. Uh, wondering where you as a group take the position on the victory of Donald Trump's last year. Okay, let's see. I think I think on the nominee, does anyone want to uh, touch that? I think uh, whoever it is, she should be the best candidate <laughs> of the group. I, I agree with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I think it's way too early. I appreciate the question. But what I do think is telling is look at the number of people who have thrown their hat in the ring and how many of them are women. I think back on uh, my granddaughter is seven years old. Uh, her first president was President Barack Obama, a black man. She thought her second president was going to be a girl, as she said, Hillary. I loved the lens through which she looked because whether it was gender or color, it did not matter to her. So may the best woman win. Right. On, on, on the issue of reproductive health, I mean, you're going to see us fighting very yes. hard on that issue. The Democrats are not divided in that in any way. Yes. Uh, our caucus is very firmly pro-choice. There will be uh, legislation, uh, hopefully, that we will pass that will protect uh, the public from onerous state laws that seem to put obstacles in front of abortion. And uh, on the Appropriations Committee, uh, there will yes. be a money put forth towards uh, contraception and so forth and health care. Mm -hmm. And the third one was, uh, what do we want to do to the president? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the members said that you don't want to impeach the president. Oh. So that, listen, here's, here's what I think we, you've heard from all of us. I, 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 and I know, I'll just speak for myself, I'm almost tired about hearing about this president. I mean, we are putting forth a positive agenda. The Democrats are in the majority. The Demo women were swept in, and we have work to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are hoping that the president comes along. We're going forward. All right. Thank you. I want to respond to, to the question of reproductive health. I have told women who are pro-choice and have had, I mean, pro-life and have had some very deep discussions. I am so pro-choice. So every woman in America who wants to be pro-life has that choice. That is what this is about. This is not, when you say someone's pro-choice, it is not advocating that women get abortions. It's advocating that a woman has the right to choose what's right for her, her body, her family, and her God. And I will never back down from that. When it comes to our president, I want a president that is going to represent the people of this country first, a president that understands what the truth means, a president that respects the decorum and the, the processes and our traditions of this great country. I want a president that I can stand up and say I'm proud of, even if I disagree with their policy. So I am not talking about Donald Trump. I'm talking about the office of the president, and I'm talking about the people of this country that we have been sent here to represent. And despite all that you see, our democracy is strong enough to stand through this with the resilience of women who have traditionally throughout history never sat down when they were confronted with challenges. We have one of the greatest challenges that I know this country has confronted. And with the leadership of women and this great caucus, we're going to get the job done.